what uh, either the Holy Spirit does or God does or Jesus does and, and let's observe as we go. Uh, another thing we have been seeing is the rise in the conflict between the uh, the apostles, primarily apostles at first, and the Jewish leadership. And this uh, uh, rise in, in conflict uh, seems to be uh, uh, part of his contribute to it for the fact that the apostles keep going to the temple to teach on a regular basis, on, on a daily basis, an ongoing basis, they go to the temple to teach. And they, they're having great success teaching in the temple. And uh, as we said earlier, that's, that's a good place to be expected to find people who are interested in the, in the word of God or interested in godly things. So it's a good place to be going uh, for the apostles to teach. So what, what I see in this first part of the, of the book uh, is a recording of the gospel that is first preached in Jerusalem and how it is very effective. And uh, many people uh, come to the gospel and, and follow or, or, or uh, have faith in the gospel, become Christians in Jerusalem. We're going to see, uh, when we get to chapter at the, uh, chapter eight, we're going to see a change in that, but it's primarily the, the teachings by the apostle, apostles and the teaching is, is a, around the temple as they're gathering there. We finished up in the middle of chapter five last time. And then in, in that uh, setting, the apostles had been in the, in, in the temple teaching that had healed a, a lame man, uh, the, they had been scolded for that and rebuked and said, don't do that anymore. Uh, they come back to the temple and uh, uh, be begin teaching and they start having uh, 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 great success uh, in, in their teaching in, in the temple. Uh, and it be in verse 16, uh, uh, kind of of the fifth chapter, it says, and also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Well, the problem with doing something in the temple was, as we've mentioned before, we had the, the Jewish council, which was uh, led by the, primarily led at this time or controlled at this time, by the Sadducees, who include Annas and Caiaphas, who are two very key individuals in the, the trials at, of Jesus. And the, uh, they were key, uh, two individuals were involved in rebuking the apostles for uh, 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 teaching in the temple. And now when they see their, uh, and they've, they've sent them home and told them don't teach anymore, they immediately come back and start teaching in the temple. And they're, they're having great success uh, in their, their teaching in the temple. So these people are, are getting upset. And I think two primary reasons is they saw the temple as their territory and politically they felt like they owned the temple and, and whatever happened in the temple, they had to, they had, it had to be sanctioned by them. And so they keep asking them, but what authority do you do this or don't do anything else in the name of Jesus? The second thing, the, the, the leadership of the, the council this time were primarily Sadducees and they did not believe in the resurrection. And so whenever they went preach that Jesus was raised from the dead, that was a further antagonistic idea, uh, something that they could not accept. So they get very upset. And uh, uh, in verse 17 of the fifth chapter, it talks about they rose up and they were filled with jealousy. Jealousy because the apostles were being so successful in their teaching and upset with them, of course, for, for teaching that Jesus was raised from the dead. They had them put in a jail, and we know that that didn't stick very well because in the night an angel came, uh, God intervenes and immediately turns them loose and tells them to go back to the temple on the next morning and start, start teaching again. And of course, in we know that these guards go look for them in, in the jail. They're not there. They come back and report to the, the chief priest in verse 24. Now the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words. That is that they, they weren't there. They were greatly perplexed about them 
as what would come of this. One of the reasons that they had killed Jesus was they wanted to stop the movement. One of the reasons they had, uh, had rebuked the apostles and sent them back not to teach him was they wanted to stop the movement. And now the movement just keeps escalating and growing and, uh, and they're becoming perplexed and very upset with uh, what, to, uh, what, what to do. Uh, anyway, they find them in the temple teaching, they bring them into the council and I, I think verse 28 is really an interesting observation. It says, it says in last of uh, uh, 28, it says, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, I don't think that's a, 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 a very far stretch for them to uh, come to that conclusion because the very first sermon that Peter preached, he, he talked about that they had uh, crucified him, God had raised him, and every conversation that Peter has with the council is, includes this conversation that you killed him and God raised him. Yes, Peter is trying to get them to turn around, but they will not listen uh, to him. And, uh, and then in verse 29, Peter again makes a statement that he made back in the previous appearance before the council. We must obey God rather than men. Uh, and then again, he, Peter goes back so, so that there's no no question about that is the charge that he's making against them. He says, God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on the cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And so uh, the message from Peter is always Jesus was crucified. He speaks specifically to them. They were involved in that of course we're we're all involved in that and that's the message that we have to understand if we're going to truly seek repentance from god that that we are responsible for jesus dying and that he came to bring re uh, repentance forgiveness for our sins uh, and of course peter says we're witnesses of these things as being the, the apostles and then he, he talks about this and so we it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So there's it. The Holy Spirit is something that God has given those who are his followers. Again, mentioned here in this, as it's been all through the book of Acts. And again, the idea I think in that is, is that fellowship uh, is now had with the, with the Spirit of God uh, through our repentance and turning to God. And that, just saying that in this context, these Pharisees or these Sadducees and the Pharisees that were part of them would not have had fellowship with God. They had usurped God's authority and turned the temple into something that, it, that God had not attend, uh, had intended for it to be. And so uh, they would have, with that, they were intended to kill them out of anger out of, uh, at this point in time. And we have this Pharisee, we had the Sadducees who were the primary leaders of the council we have this Pharisee who, who steps up, who is a respected teacher of the law, and he is respected with all the people. He is probably not as driven by anger as the Sadducees were, because they were in the leadership, and they saw their leadership being challenged, but also that they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, whereas the Pharisees did. He's a little more, being able to be a little bit more objective, and he challenges them to let's think about this for a moment. Truly, if we're if we're trying to be God's servants and this thing is sent to us from God, then we can't stop it. But if it's not for God, and he gives a couple of examples there uh, of people who had started the rebellion, it wasn't from God, and how it just if finally it fizzled out and it didn't accomplish anything. But in verse 39, he says, but if this is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. And so I think Peter, or, or Luke is recording for us here. This is God's movement and we've seen God's activity and yes, you're not going to stop God. And we, we see it continuing to progress in this book. And they, they flogged them this time, send them away, Tell them not to preach anymore, and we go down to verse 42 of the seventh or fifth chapter. It says, Every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus 
as the Christ. And so that ongoing preaching of the gospel, uh, even in the face of this, and in the first verse of chapter six, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, so they continue their preaching and, and teaching the Christ from the into temple and from house to house. So they could, here we're still very much temple centered uh, in, in crowds of people uh, teaching the, the gospel. Let's open it up there and see if there's any comments on the, on the chapter five. Well, Dan, let me just say you made the point I was going to uh, to make when he said uh, in there in verse 28, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. It's easy for us to sit here and say, well, yes, they were guilty of that, but you're absolutely right. We have to recognize that the preaching of the gospel brings the blood of Jesus upon me. And until we fully understand that, we really haven't understood the gospel. And I think that's something that we have to, we have to be kind in teach, teaching others, but we have to bring them to that realization too, that they are, the blood of Jesus is upon them too. And, and they're responsible for Jesus' death too. And I, that's one of the things that to me is, is important and will convict people to change. Do you think this that's is gonna, be do you think that this is going to be a big setup for chapter seven through nine or seven and eight? Um, I guess, especially seven with Stephen, you know, and what he's going to have to say. Well, I think that what I see in this is the council is getting progressively uh, more angry. And uh, I mentioned the other day, I think, by presenting the truth and putting the and, and these individuals that will not back away from from preaching, they're hardening their hearts. And so in, in some ways, God is hardening their hearts uh, and trying to uh, He's trying to get them to change, but they're they are hardening their hearts against the gospel. Now, and I, I think you're right, Adam. This is just leading up to what we're going to see next. And it's going to be interesting. That, when we get to chapter eight, that's going to kind of be the end of the focus of the preaching in the temple. Now, that's not to say they don't go to the temple anymore. It's going to be kind of the end of the focus of it. Dan, this is Alex. I, just, I, was, I was thinking about Eddie's, Eddie's uh, pointing out that, that verse there. Um, you know, just, just to reiterate, that's exactly what Paul was trying to do. The, the blood of Jesus is the only thing for us to be to be purified and made righteous and so it's kind of ironic that that they saw that um as a as an accusation that that they didn't want to accept um because that you know that is exactly what what cleanses us and and is why the gospel is good news yes it is and and if you don't see yourself as guilty requiring the death of Jesus, then you're self-justified. You can consider yourself a righteous person. And, and that's probably how these, these Sadducees saw themselves as righteous people. Some good thoughts. There's a lot in that sermon. I, I just kind of wanted to see what I saw as the, the flow of the sermon and the overview. So we have rebukes doesn't stop the, the gospel. We have beatings doesn't stop the preaching of the gospel. And uh, they're continuing in the temple daily and everything is just increasing on an ongoing basis. basis. So we have this continuing flow. And Eddie, would you mention to what you mentioned to me Sunday from Ezekiel? Uh, yeah, Dan and I had a long discussion after the uh, service on Sunday, and we were talking about the central point of the temple and how that that's where the gospel had to begin, and it may, it reminded me of Ezekiel chapter 47. Um, Ezekiel chapter 47 begins in verse 1, where uh, 
Ezekiel is brought in a vision to the uh, back to the door of the house, the, the house being the temple there. And he sees a trickle of water coming out from under the threshold. And then he's led around to the outside of the city and there's this trickle of water coming out under the gate. He goes a thousand meters, it's ankle high. He goes another thousand or cubits and it's uh, up to his knees and then it's up to his loins and then it's too deep for him even to, to walk into. And, and then finally in verse 12, it says that there are trees on each side of this river. The water has turned fresh. The Dead Sea has become fresh water. And it says the leaves will not wither. The fruit will not fail. Uh, they will bear every month because of the water that flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Uh, this river of water is the river of life that is flowing from the temple. And it's the same language that is found in Revelation 22, where we see the river of life that comes from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And on each side of that river are the, the tree of life and the leaves of the tree of life of, for the healing of the nations. It's, it's wonderful imagery that tells us what we have in God's kingdom today. Uh, so often we look at Revelation 21 and 22 and we sing songs in our songbook that talk about heaven is going to be this. But that vision there in Ezekiel 47 and the connection to that in Revelation 22 is the very point that Dan's been talking about all through here, that coming from the temple, Jesus entered into the temple carrying blood, his own blood, and then coming from that temple is the, the river of life. And it grows the further it goes. Thank you. I really think that it fits well with what we see uh, Luke recording for us here and what the apostles were doing with it. The, it fits real well with that prophecy. Thank you, Eddie. Now we're going into chapter six and the, the uh, first uh, uh, few verses of this, it uh, seems to be related to their increasing in number and they have a, a logistics problem, I guess they say, or an oversight occurs. The, the widows of the Hellenistic Jews uh, were not getting taken care of in the daily ministry like the, the widows of the native uh, uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrews were. And so they summoned the congregation and they came up with a plan. They appointed men to, uh, to take care of uh, this distribution. And I think it's important for seeing in verse 4, uh, the apostles uh, uh, said that we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The preaching of the gospel was not going to stop. These, these other things could be taken uh, care of by uh, good and faithful men who were full of the spirit of God. And they appointed uh, these, these seven men to this task. And it, it never tells about one widow they went to see, uh, but uh, we go down to verse seven then. It says, and word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great number that many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So they had this, uh, I guess, oversight or a logistics problem. They handled it well. The apostles didn't quit preaching and we have the gospel still increasing. It's that, that word, uh, it seems to be used every time it, it speaks about the, uh, the numbers. It, it's always an increasing number. And this time it's increasing greatly, including the priest. Well, probably many of these priests heard the gospel as they were administering there at the temple. And now they're beginning to uh, 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 turn to the gospel. Okay. Uh, any thoughts there? Because when we get to verse 8, we're going to get with Stephen. And we're going to uh, go to a whole new thought, I think. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and, and now looking at Stephen and, and his work. It's interesting we see him uh, appointed as one of these servants of the church there. And immediately he's out preaching the gospel. So we don't know how long uh, between verse six 
and verse eight, we don't know how long of a time period that was uh, and, and how Stephen was able to contribute to, uh, to that work, which is just based on the fact that the church, we have to come to the conclusion that these seven men uh, uh, were, uh, were, help, were, uh, were effective in what they did. Yeah. It speaks of Stephen then, uh, full of grace and power, was performing great signs and wonders among the people. We're going to see with Stephen the moving of the focus of the preaching from the temple to a synagogue. Uh, and this is a, a synagogue of the uh, Creations and the Alexandrians and the uh, and people from Cilicia and Asia. And this is synagogue of basically of Greek speaking or foreign people who had been foreign to Judea, even though they were Jewish in background. And Stephen is now going to a synagogue, which he probably was, would have been familiar with. And he was there teaching the gospel. In verse 10, it says, and yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. This is to me is reminiscent of Jesus every time that he encountered uh, a, a conflict with the Jewish leaders, whether it be the Sadducees or the Pharisees or a lawyer or a teacher or whomever it might be, they could not stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Jesus spoke. Uh, and these people are uh, uh, unable to uh, uh, contend or refute uh, the things that Stephen is saying. And so, uh, they, in verse uh, 11, they get mad. They secretly devise people, say he is blaspheming, and they stir up the people, and they drag him away and brought him before the council. Again, this council is the same group of people that Jesus stood before, that he, Peter and John were before, but the, all the apostles were before in the previous reading, and now Stephen is before this group. I want us to see as the, as the hatred and the action, I, I know they crucified Jesus, but to use the Roman authorities to do that, but it's from the time that Peter and John were before the council, all the apostles now with Stephen, the intensity of their hate or their intensity of uh, disregard for, the, for their, the speaker seems to grow. And we're going to see this with Stephen as this intensity grows. Uh, indicating their, their hatred for the gospel and what Jesus' uh, his disciples stand for. So they stir up a group of uh, people to say that uh, he's blasphemed against Moses and against God. Uh, they bring him to the council. Now, it's interesting to me in verse 13 and 14, uh, they put forth fault with and say, this man ins insistently speaks against the holy, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the custom which Moses handed down to us. Well, they, they call these false witnesses saying that he's speaking against Moses, uh, this holy place and the law. They have probably distorted the gospel that he is preaching because some of the key elements of the gospel and Jesus even mentions this back in, in Matthew 24, is the idea that this, the temple worship is going to, uh, the temple in Jerusalem are going to be destroyed and that there is going to be a change in the, in the priesthood and, and these things. And so they're taking what he says out of context. Jesus talked about he came to fulfill the law or complete the law. So there's going to be a transition to the, to the gospel or serving under Jesus, they're taking that and then using it against uh, Stephen because they don't understand what Jesus has come to accomplish. They don't accept Jesus. And, and now they're trying to, uh, uh, because that they don't accept Jesus, then they refute everything that, uh, that uh, Stephen is saying. I think this is a, uh, something that's interesting for us as we study with people who have different backgrounds and, and a different understanding of the scriptures or religion, we need to be very careful to try and convey to them. This doesn't mean they won't end up with misunderstandings what we're saying, but we need to be very careful in our, our discussions with them to try and lead them 
uh, from where they are to where, where the gospel is. Got some thoughts on that, Amy? Anyway. Anyone got some thoughts on that part of it? You know, I can't remember if, if we were talking about this in a Bible study here, if I was listening to it somewhere else, but in talking about people that, you know, both the Old and the New Testament say, having eyes they do not see and ears they don't hear, we're definitely about to see that take place and the beginnings of this. Um, and, you know, what's what's really kind of ironic about this is, when Moses came onto the scene and he led the people out of Egypt, they didn't want to listen to him and they didn't want to, they didn't want to do the traditions uh, and the laws and customs and all those things that he was bringing in. Um, and, you know, Stephen's going to talk about that, but um, it, it's just interesting that even Moses own people who were with him didn't want to listen to him. And so now they're touting Moses as, as the one that, that was the be-all, end-all of everything. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good comments. Other comments on this? Of course, verse 15 is one of those that, uh, uh, it says, fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Uh, I'd like somebody to explain that a little more fully to me, but it seems like that he, I, I would say it's a face of innocence uh, as he's standing there or sitting there before the council. So it, Stephen would have, would have been before the council. He, I think he's sincere. He's innocent in what he's saying. And he is, is not trying to be, uh, belligerent or derogatory to them, but rather he's trying to get them to see the truth of the gospel. So, then again in chapter 7 begins the, the interrogation and their questions for him. It says that the high priest says, are these things so? And he said, hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham, who was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. We're going to look at Stephen's sermon here, just kind of in an overview. But he goes and he identifies some people who are faithful. And he starts with, of course, the, the, the man of faith, Abraham, who had to make a significant change in his life, uh, move from uh, one place to another. And then he goes in, and uh, after that, he goes to and talk about uh, their, their fathers, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph, as all of these uh, were people of faith uh, who were looking for something that God was going to do for them, and he, we're going to see that they never received those things in this life, but some of them, like Abraham and Jacob and jo Joseph, had to make some large moves or large transitions or changes in their lives uh, to get uh, to, to follow God, and so their changes were based upon listening to God and they were people of faith. And we're, we're going to have enter, uh, well, then we're going to go to Moses as, and then uh, then the children of Israel. We're going to have interspersed, interspersed with this. We're going to have people who do not have faith who actually uh, try to stop their, their eventual savior or redeemer. And that would be the, uh, the 10 brothers of, of Joseph as they had a hatred for him or a jealousy for him, as they thought they were going to do him harm, but he eventually became their savior. They rejected him, sold him into slavery, but he's the one who saved them from starvation and the famine. That moved the family down to Egypt. Of course, things turned bad in Egypt after a, after a period of time, and they needed another savior, and Moses comes along. Moses' first attempt at being a savior was, you know, we often think about that being a Moses attempt, uh, and but they did not even accept him in, in his own attempt, uh, and he, of course, that ended up in failure. 
he goes to Midian for 40 years and comes back in God's direction, and they still are having a hard time accepting Moses. They finally get tired of the, uh, the Egyptians and do go into the wilderness with Moses, but he speaks about it when they're in the wilderness, they, uh, they continue to reject God. They want to go back to Egypt. They don't want to go where God is taking them. They wander 40 years and talks about carrying along their idols with them the whole time they're in this wilderness. And so th this sermon, I, th I think, is filled with the ideas of sometimes God leads you to a new place. There's a time for change, and the faithful go ahead and make that move. But those who don't, are not, don't have faith in God keep hanging back, wanting to do their own thing rather than, uh, than going ahead and following God through faith. And it, I think that's the, kind of the flow of uh, Stephen's sermon here as he's trying to get them to see that, uh, 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 that God is trying to lead them to a new place and getting to get them to be where God would have them to be into the spiritual promised land as Moses was trying to lead the, uh, the, the children of Israel to the land of Canaan. And to get to the land of Canaan, to get the law of Moses, they first had to be Abraham, had to leave Haran and, and go and dwell in a, in a, as a visitor in the land. They had to go to Egypt and dwell as visitors, then come and wander in the wilderness 40 years, and then come uh, to Canaan to the land of the promise. Well, seeing that that's the land of Canaan is not the end all, as each of these other stops were not, uh, uh, seems to be kind of the flow of, uh, uh, of to me, of this sermon. And uh, I think it becomes, as he gets near the end of this sermon, uh, uh, we talked about, he talks about David building a, a temple for God as they were part of the things they had uh, were so concerned about was Stephen preaching about the temple or something the temple might go away, uh, I, I think is the idea. When he gets down to verse 46, it says, and David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the most high does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will thou build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my uh, repose? Was it not my hand which made all of these things? And that's a quote from Isaiah 66. And so Stephen's come back and say, they've traveled and they've settled in all these places. They built a tabernacle, they built a temple but none of those things can house God. And he's trying to get them to see that God is going to be housed within us uh, or, 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 or not, he's not housed in things. So if the temple is torn down, if Jerusalem is destroyed, that does not affect God and his ability to, to be God and for, uh, for us to serve him. Uh, I've covered a lot of stuff there real quickly. Uh, would y'all want to open it up and just give some thoughts on this part of the of the lesson before we get to the the tragic end? Now, I know there's a lot I left out of Stephen's sermon. <laughs> Okay, uh, we go down to the, the end of this lesson and uh, <clears throat> so uh, it seems almost first 51 seems like an abrupt change or abrupt uh, change in, the, in what he's saying, but uh, it, it's, it seems to be the natural thing is he's been, he's told them He's given them several examples of people who had faith, how they submitted, 
and those people who were associated with him, brothers or, or countrymen, uh, would not and actually push back against the leading that was coming from God in that. And so we get down uh, and he makes a statement about God doesn't dwell in, in physical temples. And, and that's the idea. He's, God's trying to lead us someplace else now. In uh, verse 51, he says, you, you men who are stiff necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. Then he mentions which of the prophets did they not persecute? And they killed those who were previously anointed, who announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have become. So uh, you who have received the law as ordained of angels, yet did not keep it. So he puts these people in the same category that the people who had received the law at Mount Sinai, they had rejected and turned away from it, but also they had, uh, had persecuted and killed all the prophets. They had killed the righteous one. Yes, Stephen now is saying that they are responsible. You're, you're bring, Stephen is bringing the blood of, blood of Christ uh, upon them, upon their heads. The same thing that Peter had said uh, on the two occasions when he was before uh, the council. And so the, but by this point in time, the council has really, they've turned their themselves away from God. And by turning away from God, they are, uh, Stephen is, uh, is rebuking them and, and showing them where they really are. Of course, when they heard this, that's why I say we're, we're escalating now, they're cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him and uh, uh, very upset, angry with him. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen is a, is a, a special uh, vision of God here. And it's very, very much like the, uh, some of the ones we've seen in the Old Testament, other prophecies one seeing the glory of God and Jesus. This seems to be a special reassurance that God is giving Stephen at this time. Uh, they end up stoning him. Uh, they cover their ears. They won't listen to this. They stone him and Stephen uh, gives up the spirit and said, Lord Jesus, re receive my spirit. Uh, and ask the Lord not to hold us to their account. Uh, so we see this, the escalation of the, of the conflict from the first time Peter and John went to the temple until the stoning of Stephen shows that how the council has completely rejected the gospel message. They rejected Jesus, they crucified him, they rejected the gospel message, and now they've stoned Stephen preaching the gospel and so I, I think that's kind of where where we are and so this is the I guess the two attempts of, of God to to cause the the leadership and, and the temple to repent both of them have only uh, caused them to be hardened and turned further away from him uh, and at this point completely reject his word okay open it up there and, and, and I'm sure there's some comments on this uh, Dan, uh, I, I like the fact that you started there in chapter two to come to this point, because there's one phrase that connects all of that, and that's the one that's found there in verse 54, where they were cut to the quick. This is the third time we've seen that phrase. Um, it's found there in chapter 754, it's found in chapter 5 in verse 33, and it's also found in chapter 2 in verse 37. Uh, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon, it says they were cut to the heart. It's the exact same word in, or same phrase in Greek. It's just translated slightly different in English each time. But that really demonstrates what the gospel does. It, it pierces into our hearts and lays our heart open for God to see what is there. And either he finds a good heart that is penitent and says, brethren, what should we do? Or we find a heart full of evil that they stop their ears up and, and rush to destroy the one who's speaking to them.
And I really believe that this occasion here sets the groundwork for God destroying the, uh, it, it's one of the sort of the, some of the final efforts in God's destroying Jerusalem and the temple. Because the whole council seems to have rejected the, uh, the message. The only thing that could have caused them to repent, they have rejected. Do you think there's some irony here in the fact that he's talking to Israelites and he says that they're resisting the Holy Spirit or striving against the Holy Spirit? I mean, the whole meaning of Israel is one who wrestled with God. Um, and so, I mean, he's calling them out for exactly what their namesake is. But also, you know, he says that they resist the Holy Spirit. Of course, the whole uncircumcision bit definitely, you know, definitely cuts right to them. No pun intended. But, uh, but also, you know, that specific phrase, resisting the Holy Spirit, if you look in Isaiah 63, um, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, In all their suffering, he's talking about Israel, in all their suffering he suffered, and the angel of his presence saved them. He redeemed them because of his love and compassion. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of the past. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he became their enemy and fought against them. So, you know, the whole crux of this message is not just that they're resisting God, but if they continue to resist God, he will resist against them as well. And that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. I think you're exactly right. They have, they have grieved the spirit, spirit of God. And I think because of the, the things in Isaiah, they probably understood what Stephen was saying there, that you're supposed to be the people that have the spirit of God. That was their claim to the temple was his Holy Spirit was there. And now you have resisted him. And, uh, and they, they understood what the consequences of that were. Well, kind of one step further with that phrase, when we see it again, and, uh, you know, it's variation of it in Ephesians 4.30, when Paul is writing to that church, and, you know, he starts out saying, the thief must no longer steal, he, he no rotten talk should come up out of his mouth, but only what's good for the building up of someone. And then verse 30 says, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit who sealed you for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, insult, slander must be removed from you. And that's exactly what they're doing to Stephen right now. Steve. Yes. Good thoughts. And it's, I think it's the idea that God has done so much to redeem them from Egypt, and yet they, they turned away from him and and... That's the same type of thing that we can grieve him, his Holy Spirit, if we turn away from him. Okay, what we had in the with the with Steve, we started off. We had the gospel spreading by the apostles' teaching. In chapters uh, six and seven, we have a new teacher gets involved, and uh, I think this is part of uh, <clears throat> the spread of the gospel. The temple uh, preaching was primarily described in these first chapters as being done by the apostles. Now, Stephen becomes a synagogue preacher. I guess I can uh, characterize him that way. Is he, that becomes a new venue and a new, a new preacher. He's not an apostle. He is someone else that is out preaching the gospel. What we're going to see with the stoning of Stephen now, we're going to go to multiple new venues, and we're going to see multiple new preachers or teachers of the gospel. And that's what we're going to see in the, uh, uh, the first part of, uh, of chapter 8. Uh, in, in the first part we have with Saul was hardly agreed with putting him to death. 
The great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and they're scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So they stay, and from that perspective, I, I think that probably the temple preaching probably continues, but these many Christians are scattered everywhere. And uh, in verse four, it says, therefore they that were scattered went about preaching the word. So we have this expansion of places that the gospel is preached and the people that are preaching the gospel uh, is expanding. It's just, it's just like that river that uh, Eddie was uh, mentioned from uh, Ezekiel. It's, it's growing and it's flowing and it's expanding wider as it flows out away from the temple. And now we have another one of the, uh, of the seven. This time it's uh, Philip. Uh, and he goes out and uh, he went to, to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And they were giving uh, paying attention to it. Uh, and uh, many who had unclean spirits, they were, were casting out, they were healed. And there was much rejoicing in his city. And we're going to see that, <clears throat> that uh, uh, as they were, uh, Philip was working there, uh, they believed Philip, the preaching of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus, and they were baptized, men and women alike. So Philip now goes to Samaria, which is probably a Samaritan area. It's not a Jewish area, and it's an area that uh, Jesus went through many times, and he taught uh, the woman at the well and, and the whole uh, city there. He uh, uh, taught them uh, in, the, in Samaria. We see Philip is able to uh, teach the gospel. Many people are, uh, are baptized. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans received the word of God. They sent Peter and John up to, uh, uh, to Samaria. There they, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not fallen upon them and they had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, and then they laid their on their hands, and they, be they began receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think it's, I want to stop and just uh, think about that for just a moment. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on the apostles at the initiation of the preaching. And from that point forward to all the people who had been taught the gospel were Jews and the, they seemed to have had the idea that God was with them because they were baptized and because of God coming and being with the apostles on the day of Pentecost. We go to Samaria now and Philip preaches the gospel. He baptizes them and Peter and John come up and the, they lay hands on them to sanction them, it seems to be to sanction them and to demonstrate that they too are now Christians, even though they are not Jews, they are now Christians and that they have the, the sanction of the apostles, or the sanction, really the sanction of God. But Peter and John come up and, and, and do this. It, it seems to be a, a two-step process here, but it, whereas on, uh, for Jews, it initially was a one-step process. What I see in this, and I'd, I'd like to have some discussion on this, is that Peter and John had been with Jesus many times and he went through Samaria and taught there. And so they seem to have a recognition that yes, God does mean for these Samaritans to, have, to, to uh, become Christians. And they go up there and they, they sanction or approve that uh, through the Holy Spirit. Whereas uh, we're going to see later with the, uh, with the uh, centurion in his household, God has to sanction that directly because there's some question, there seems to be some question on the part of those there because they ask the question later is, well, God did that so we can't argue against it. So let's open it up and see if there's any discussion or am I, am I way far afield here? Yeah, I, think. And I, I agree with you. Uh, 
I, I was thinking about that as you were talking about it. You know, we often talk about Cornelius as being the first Gentile convert, and, and I think it's true, he was. The Samaritans were not really Jews, but they were not Gentiles either. Mm -hmm. They were a religious half-breed. They were Gentiles that had been resettled there probably by the Assyrians and uh, had been forced to accept the religion of Israel, but only a portion of the religion of Israel. And, and so that's why they had this, this, you know, kind of a religious hybrid system. But it's interesting, back in chapter 1 and verse 8, when Jesus had told the apostles, when they'd asked, you know, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he told us not for you to know the times or epics, what the Father has determined. Uh, but he says, you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. If we were writing that based on the ministry of Jesus, we would say uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Galilee. But instead it says Jerusalem, uh, Judea, and Samaria. And so... Uh, it, it's interesting to consider how the Samaritans were viewed by the uh, by these apostles. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think that it's clearly Jesus had made that point during his ministry, and they seem to catch on to that. And they would have traveled in Samaria multiple times. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, in the next part of uh, chapter eight, we have the, uh, Simon the uh, sorcerer who has the, still has, he's, he's become a, he's been baptized and become a Christian. Uh, he's wants to have the ability to lay hands on people and wants to buy that. Uh, it appears from wanting to buy it, he expects to be able to make profit with it, like he has been doing with his sorcery. Peter corrects him in that. Uh, Simon apparently repents in verse 24, and uh, and re recognizing that uh, the message of God, the power of God, is not for sale. It it may be that uh, as we're getting into this, uh, moving forward from from Judea, uh, from Jews to Samaritans to Greeks, that we're going to, uh, he's put this in here to get us to see that there are going to be different kinds of problems that they're going to encounter with the, the, the backgrounds, the religious backgrounds of people. Generally speaking, the Jews didn't have sorcery because the law of Moses uh, had, had laws that dealt with that. But the further you got away from Jerusalem, got among the Greeks, you would have that. And so maybe this is recorded to get us to see that, that it's not, God does not uh, recognize or accept a hybrid religion, but rather it's a devotion to God and it's not for sale. That's a, kind of my thought on this. Uh, and Peter then in verse 25, uh, he uh, uh, completed his work there. And so when he saw them testify and spoke the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem, Peter and John, and were repeat, preaching the gospel in many, village, many villages of the Samaritans. So now Stephen goes up and gets the work started amongst the Samaritans. Peter and John come up and endorse that. And then they go back from Samaria to Jerusalem preaching all the way home. And so uh, the gospel is again, uh, we, we saw it start in Jerusalem now, we have it spreading out everywhere. I want us to see that Philip to me is just one example, because it talked about in the, back in the first the chapter, the, the Christians who were uh, uh, scattered whenever we're preaching the gospel. So there are lots of people now the numbers of preacher is exponential uh, compared to what it was when they were in Jerusalem. And Philip is just an example of one of these people that has been scattered and is out there preaching the, preaching the gospel. Next, we're going to see Philip is, uh, meets the eunuch. 
uh, and he has this uh, wonderful uh, uh, conversation with the eunuch. They're studying from the book of Isaiah. The eunuch asks all the right questions, and all of us want to meet the eunuch as we're studying because he is so so open. To, he's a religious man. It's open to the gospel, but he ends up in uh, in in, uh, in Ethiopia, and that is a clue that the gospel is now in Ethiopia uh, at this point in time. So I think what we see uh, in chapter eight is the idea that this expansion of the gospel, we, we have people are scattered taking the gospel. Uh, they're going to different uh, uh, nationalities of people now. And even it's in Ethiopia, uh, that uh, it's been doing. And I think another interesting thing about that is that Philip had learned from the apostles. Philip has now taught some people of Samaria. He's now taught the eunuch and what he supposed the eunuch did when he got home uh, to Ethiopia. So I'll open up one last time and then we'll quit after, after this. I guess another thing I didn't mention in this and I, I wanted to mention is that God is in control of the gospel uh, and, and getting Philip around to preach the gospel. And, uh, and that's, so God is directly involved uh, in the spread of the gospel here. Dan, I might mention uh, one thing, just as, as what you're talking about, the gospel being preached in Ethiopia. We know historically that there was a very strong Christian community based in Ethiopia uh, that, that dates back as far as we know, at least the second century AD. Uh, and this this certainly gives us a clue of where that may have started. Right, okay. And we, we do know that uh, there was a very strong contingency of Christians in, in uh, Egypt and Africa and Ethiopian area uh, in the very early centuries all that area. Any other thoughts tonight? You know, what's kind of interesting about this to me is, you know, when we look at the book of Joshua, what we see is when the, when the people are coming into the land, there's a, a central campaign, a southern campaign, and a northern campaign. And that's how the land is, that's how the conquest takes place in these stages. So at this point, we now have the gospel message starting essentially in Jerusalem and then spreading out to Judea and Samaria. So that's going kind of to the central and the north. And then now we have the Ethiopian eunuch taking that message south as well as probably others that were coming. I mean, certainly in Acts chapter two, we see others from the South. Um, but this message is beginning to spread. And the main catalyst for that is persecution. Um, so it, it's just interesting that that's how this takes place. You know, they, they endure a time of hardship and then the means that, that conquest is going to take place is through these multiple fronts. And that gospel message is just going to spread and spread and spread. And then as Jesus said, it goes to the ends of the earth. We're going to the end of the Roman empire at this point um, by the end of Acts. So just interesting to see how the, it kind of directionally takes place right here. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good thought. And uh, again, that's an example of, uh, of Stephen stoning and the persecution of how God can use something that is horrible to a good end. And uh, we have trouble with that, right? And, and trying to think about that. And but God used something very difficult to his, to his good. Where is the ear? One of the guys on the pudding. Okay, any other thoughts? 
Thank you, Dan. Okay, well, I'm gonna get uh, Alex Meyer. I know you spoke up earlier, I thought you did. Turn your mic on and uh, lead us in a closing prayer. Will do. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that we have this story of, of your people and as we can read it, read about your kingdom unfolding and, and seeing the, the power and wisdom of your word as it spread. We're thankful that we can participate in that same same story as, as your people, uh, as we try to fill this world with your, your glory, as we try to spread the good news of your son. We are thankful for those that have gone before us that have, have trusted in you, and we pray for their, their faith and trust as we seek to put you first, and by doing so, put others above ourselves. Pray that you would help us to, uh, to humbly serve you as we try to to be your ambassadors as we try to show your love and mercy to, to the world that so desperately needs you. Thank you for this, uh, this ability we have to, to study your word together. Um, even though we are apart, we can um, draw encouragement and wisdom from, from each other. Thank you again for your son and for the, the sacrifice and for the, the redemption that he gives to us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you Amen. all. Thanks, Dave.